repeat, the Danish system of medical ethics is the best going. It's better than the UK, it's better than the US, because the US and the UK medical ethics committees are composed mostly of scientists, 8 to 12 members, mostly scientists, perhaps a lawyer, perhaps an ethicist, and perhaps one public representative. It's not balanced. There's no representation of patients' rights, no representation of consumer protection organizations, and it's not, it's not a balanced, it's not 50-50. It's way too lopsided. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you. Right. Madam? I just want to say that um, while I'm really, really against some of experiments, um, but for me, I think the worst thing must be is um, because I'm faced with a, a moral dilemma. Um, well, I've been asthmatic for 10 years. Um, and about a month ago, I um, had a very bad asthma attack. Um, and I had to take um, my expensolin. And as far as I know, there is no alternative to that. I mean, I just hate to take it. Um, but at that time, I nearly passed out twice. And all my lips had gone blue, I said it was too lack of oxygen, they wanted me to go to hospital. And, you know, I'm just saying that is the moral dilemma because um, I don't want the animals to go through anything for me. Um, but it's just such an awful moral dilemma to be faced with, and I just wonder what your, your answer is on that. Okay, my answer is this it's quite simple. The animal testing was a waste of time and animal lives and cause a lot of unnecessary animal suffering. The people that you should really be grateful to are the people in the phase one and the phase two clinical trials. Because those human guinea pigs that really weed out what the human complications are going to be, what the human only complications are going to be. In other words, there are complications in human beings that only occur in human beings, and not in dogs, not in cats, not in monkeys. So what I'm saying is that, based on, what, on that first slide that we saw, the, the problems are weeded out in phase two and phase three. That's where most experimental drugs fall out. So I'm saying, if you want to be grateful to somebody, be grateful to those individuals, those, those patients who agreed to take Ventolin in phase two and phase three. Phase one, they shouldn't have been used on healthy individuals. You don't give beta blockers to healthy individuals. Right, but, what about when you feel that you don't want to take anything that's been tested on animals, but there's no alternative? Um, it's, not, it's not your fault. It's not your fault that they were tested on animals. The reason they are tested on animals is because the legal system is an asshole. Okay, it's an ass rather. That was a South African expression. Sorry. You can vote on that. But the legal system is an ass. Okay? And, and as, as we said before, it was written about 50 years ago. And it's out of date. Passe. Finito. And we have to wake up our legislators and say, you know, how about changing this? It's out of date. It's irrelevant. Adam. Um, what is the alternative to human and animal experiments? Uh, the question is, what is the alternative to, to animal experimentation and human experimentation? Well, the alternative to animal experimentation with respect to medical research is to stop doing animal experimentation because it's irrelevant. If you're speaking about veterinary medicine, that's, a, that's, another, that's another kettle of fish, that's another discussion. Sir. The BBC doctors are telling us that thanks to the science, we are living longer, and you can see your, that's what they are talking. Could you please? I mean, okay. okay. Um, why are we living longer? Well, if you look at the Industrial Revolution and so forth, uh, our standards of hygiene and cleanliness have gone up tremendously, number one. Um, we are living longer, we are suffering more from chronic disease, so our quantity has gone up, our quality has gone down. But the reason we're living longer is because, you know, we're drinking cleaner water, um, we live in better housing conditions, and that sort of thing. That, and I mean, people like uh, um, Professor McEwen, who was a Dean of Medical Faculty in one of the universities in the UK, uh, he very clearly, in his book, and he's by no means an anti sectionist He's, he's completely uh, establishment. He's a medical doctor, um, and he very clearly demonstrated in his book, among other works, that it is improved nutrition and hygiene 
which has led to longevity and not animal experiments. I mean, there's no way, think about it logically. Um, there's such a huge difference between the way animal bodies work and human bodies work. How, how can you ever extrapolate with any sense of confidence results from animals to, to people? Uh, any veterinarian who respects himself, um, if he's an equine vet, he will not touch a canary because he knows nothing about canaries. So if there's a, such a huge, vast difference within veterinary medicine, um, and today with the, with the human genome, I mean everybody sitting here is just so different uh, with, re, with regard to the way you would handle, the way your body would react to a particular drug, simply, simply because of human variation, based on your gender, your age, your ethnic background, your lifestyle, how much coffee you drink a day, whether you drink grape juice before or after you took the medication. There's just so much, there's no way, no way, that you can bring all that into your um, equation. <coughs> Time for one more question, I'm afraid. Do you think there's any mileage in pursuing the human rights legislation to say it's our legal right to take drugs that haven't been tested on animals, both for ethical and scientific reasons, because we can't rely on as a non-lawyer, yes, but we have had some uh, legal response on that, and we were told it's it's not the, it's not the best argument to go to court. There are there are stronger arguments. Than that. Thank you. Thank you.